Hey guys, Miss Gosling here. In this video, we're going to be talking about the inner lives of stars. And by the end of the video, you will be able to describe the inner processes of stars. Um, so your understanding is applications and skills. There's a lot of them for this. Um, so the biggest one here, the biggest two here are nuclear f fusion and the nature of stars. Stellar spectra we've already mostly spoken about. Um, applications and skills, you should be able to qualitatively describe, um, and you'll note qualitative, um, so this is words, not, not numbers. Um, you should be able to qualitatively describe the equilibrium between pressure and gravitation in stars. You should be able to explain how the chemical composition of a star might be determined from its spectrum. And you should be able to describe the different types of nuclear fusion reactions taking place off the main sequence. So let's go ahead and get started. So equilibrium in stars. So if we think about a star, we want to start by thinking about the forces. So um, with, a st with stars, um, all of the different atoms in the star are, of course, gravitationally attracted to one another. So gravity is kind of pushing that star in on itself. Um, now, on the other hand, um, we all, that star is a giant nuclear fusion reactor. And nuclear fusion um, creates a radiation pressure pushing outwards. And so what happens is we have an equilibrium in our stars in that the force of gravity is perfectly balanced by the radiation pressure of the star as it fuses hydrogen to helium in its core here. So that brings us to nuclear fusion. So stars are actually giant fusion reactors. And we have talked about the process by which nuclear fusion happens, but I want to take a moment to review. Um, so nuclear fusion is when light atomic nuclei are combined to form heavier atomic nuclei. And it's important that you know that nuclear fusion stops at iron. And the reason for that is that if we look at binding energy per nucleon, um, our graph of binding energy per nucleon versus the number of nucleons an atom has, kind of looked, if you remember, a little bit like this. Um, let's see, B-E-P-N. So this peak here, that's iron. So we can fuse on the left side of my graph. So with graphs of my smaller nuclei, undergo fusion. And my bigger nuclei undergo nuclear fission. They break apart. And the reason for that is the higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the isotope of an atom. So whenever we go from a more stable, a less stable isotope to a more stable isotope, we are releasing energy. If we want to go from a more stable isotope to a less stable isotope, so for example, from iron back to hydrogen, um, we need to give that atom a lot of energy. Um, so of course, um, when we're talking about a nuclear fusion reactor, if we are trying to release energy, which is how fusion reactions work, um, we cannot go beyond iron because at that point, um, fusion stops. At that point, we need energy in order to create new elements. So what actually happens is we take two hydrogens, um, and we can, you can see this diagram over on the right. So two hydrogens will combine to form deuterium and an electron and a neutrino. Um, let's see if you could tell me what kind of decay that is. Review your notes for me. Um, then we can combine deuterium and hydrogen to create helium and a photon. And again, review the kind of decay that this is. Um, and finally, two helium-3 nuclei can combine to create a helium-4 nucleus and two new hydrogens, which, if we go back here, can combine to create deuterium, an electron, and a neutrino. And so you can see that this can be a self-sustaining nuclear reaction until we eventually run out of hydrogen. So um, let's start by talking, so let's go ahead and talk about nuclear fusion and main sequence stars. And we actually define main sequence stars as stars that are primarily made up of hydrogen. Um, and so they are stars that are currently going undergoing the fusion reaction that we talked about on the previous slide. Um, so they're turning hydrogen into helium. Now in the previous slide, we talked about how two hydrogens combine to form deuterium, a positron, and a neutrino. Hopefully you guys identified that correctly as beta plus decay. Um, and then we have a deuterium and a hydrogen combining to form helium and a gamma particle. And again, I hope you all properly identify that as gamma decay. And then finally, we have two heliums combining to form heavy helium. Um, and again, this is a self-sustaining nuclear reaction until all of the hydrogen has turned into helium. Um, so here's a good example of an IB question. 
Main sequence stars are in equilibrium under the action of forces. Outline how this equilibrium is achieved. Now, again, this is, an, this is a question that is qualitative, so I want you to try solving it on your own before we look at the, um, before we look at the mark scheme. But two things I want to make sure that you know. First, um, this question is two marks. So that means you should make two distinct points. Um, and second, I want to point out the command term used here is outline. Um, per IB, outline means to give a brief account or summary. Again, that's give a brief account or summary. So go ahead, take a moment, pause this video, and write down your answer to example one. Um, and go ahead and prepare a different colored pen so that when we go over the mark scheme together, you can mark up your answer and see how many marks you would give yourself. Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope you all paused the video and answered the question. Um, get your different color pen out um, so and see how many marks you get. So um, in this question, we have um, two things that are mentioned. So we have um, photon slash fusion slash radiation force slash pressure balances gravitational force slash power pressure. And that's your first mark is by saying that our star is in equilibrium because of these two forces. And you are asked to make to give both directions correctly. So you should say that the outwards radiation pressure is balanced or balances the inwards gravitational pressure or gravitational force. Um, again, other words to that effect is, is, is written. And so your grader does have some um, leeway to be a little bit nice or a little bit meaner if your words don't match what they're looking for. Um, so take a moment, think what you notice about the mark scheme. Um, one thing I would like to point out is we have backslashes here. Um, what this is showing is that you could use multiple different words to mean the same thing. So you could say photon radiation, fusion radiation, or it's photon force or photon pressure, fusion force or pressure, and radiation force or pressure. And all of those would be perfectly accurate for giving the answer to this question. Um, so give yourself a grade out of two. Um, don't be nice because it's very, um, it's very important that you are really being honest with yourself making, to see how well you are getting some of this information. So now that we have talked through um, what's going on in stars, um, I want to take a moment to, to talk about how we know what stars are made up of. So we've talked about how you know hydrogen is combining to form deuterium, which is combining to form helium, which is combining to form heavy helium. And I don't know about you, but when I was first taught this, my question was, how do you know? Um, this is how we know. So we can compare um, the ideal black body spectrum, which is pictured on the left, with the actual stellar spectrum that you can see on the right. So take a moment. What do you notice? What are the differences between these two spectra? Okay, so one thing I hope you noticed is that we have um, a bunch of dips um, in that right hand picture. So there's like this guy, there's this guy, there's this big dip, this one, this one, and these little guys here. Um, so you can see a bunch of different dips on the right versus that lovely smooth curve we have in that ideal black body spectrum. So when we look at the spectrum of an actual star, you can see another example here, um, we can determine the chemical makeup of the star by looking at where the star dips. So again, here we've got a dip kind of right a, a little bit above uh, probably around 4100 angstroms another one at about 4400 one at about 48 4900 and another at about 6600 um, those dips are matched with elemental emission spectra to determine the elements that make up a star so here we've got about four dips and you can see the wavelength here is measured in angstroms which is not quite the same as um as um, measuring in meters, but this does actually line up really nicely um, with the hydrogen emission spectrum. So we've got four dips here, um, and um, if we convert from angstroms to, me to meters, which I'm not gonna do, you're not expected to be able to do that, what we find is that that first dip is at 410 nanometers. The second is at 434 nanometers. Um, the third is at 486 nanometers and the fourth is at 656 nanometers. Um, and as you can see on the right, 
that actually lines up perfectly with my hydrogen emission spectrum. So we can see that the star is mostly made up of hydrogen because we have dips where um, the hydrogen emission spectrum is. And the reason for that is that those wavelengths are absorbed by the hydrogen atoms in the star. And so as a result, instead of being emitted, they are absorbed and used to move electrons to a higher energy state. Um, so those photons don't make it through the star, which is why they don't appear um, in that um, wavelength spectrum graph. Um, so let's take a look at another IB example. The top graph shows the observed spectrum from star X. The second graph shows the hydrogen emission spectrum. Suggest, using the graphs, why star X is most likely to be a main sequence star. So here, what I would do is I would start and I would look at my dips. And you can see I've got a dip here, right around 656, 660 nanometers. I have another one here between 400 and 500, like so. And I have two more, um, both between 400 and 500, but on the lower end of that scale. So what I would say is the dips in the graph or in the um, intensity wavelength graph, they match the wavelength um, of the hydrogen emission spectrum. This suggests that the star is mostly made up of hydrogen, which therefore means that it must be a main sequence star. So let's go ahead and look at the mark scheme and see how we so we said the wavelengths of the dips correspond to the wavelengths in the emission spectrum. Good. The absorption lines in the spectrum of star X suggest it, cre it contains predominantly hydrogen. So, um, so that, that means that star X is mostly made up of hydrogen. Um, or we could say, so we could say that, or we could say that main sequence stars are rich in hydrogen. Um, so as you can see, a couple things that are missing. We don't have, have other words to that effect. So you would want to make sure you had specific, these, this specific language in your answer. Um, the other thing I hope you notice is that or. So this is saying that there's two different things you could write to jump from the observation that the dips correspond with the emission spectrum to the conclusion that the star is made up of hydrogen. So again, take a moment, grade the answer that I wrote, and again, don't be nice. Um, so takeaways. First, Stars are stable because the outward gas pressure is balanced by the inward gravitational force. Make sure you know outward gas, inward gravity. Um, main sequence stars turn hydrogen to helium and are mostly composed of hydrogen. And we can use stellar spectra to determine whether a star is in the main sequence. So you can use stellar spectra to figure out is a star mostly made up of hydrogen. So there you go. Um, you now know all about the inner lives of stars. Best of luck and happy learning.